James Colin Harding, JO3. That's a journalist's petty officer. In April, April 17th, um, and went to um, Rio. Um, we didn't expect general visiting, but uh, having been through a lot of that, uh, I had the uh, welcome of boards translated into Portuguese. So we did have general visiting on our way to Vietnam, went around Africa through Sunder Straits, uh, and then went to uh, uh, Subic Bay in the, in the Philippines. The, uh, uh, on board in the Philippines came Lieutenant Brian Gray, uh, and I'm using their old ranks here, you know, probably are admirals now, but I'm using the ranks that were in place when I was there. Uh, Gray was CTA 77 Public Affairs, and I got transferred to him uh, to be the strike journalist and going over to the line, you know, told me about the assignments and stuff like that. And as it turned out, um, my day, and I'll sketch, out, sketch it out for you, um, I get up, we were only flying uh, noon, uh, uh, midnight to noon, only doing night hops because at that time we had the only big deck carrier on Yankee Station. Uh, so we drew the straw that said, uh, big deck, you fly at night. So that's what we did. So I, I go to the Integration Operational Intelligence Center uh, and uh, attend all the, all the briefings. First one would be at 10 o'clock, first launch was at midnight. Okay, and that would start my day. You always had to go to the to the pre-brief, uh, the pre-launch briefing, to know what kind of targets they were going to go after, and what was important, uh, what the uh, earlier uh, ships had learned from a bomb damage assessment uh, standpoint. Uh, so they did all those. Uh, uh, so you had that background, and then we had a space over in the Admiral's country and we turned into primarily the attack force uh, uh, debrief room. Uh, a photographic interpreter from VA-85 and I shared responsibility for that face, and that means putting up the maps so we could tell, you know, coordinates, uh, making the place hom homey. Uh, we got our hands on popcorn and we got our hands on, uh, the, the flight surgeon, you know, did did two strikes, uh, passing out uh, Christian Brothers brandy, and then he says, Hardy, yeah, you're in charge of the brandy. So here I was, a you know, corporal, passing out brandy, brandy on, on a warship. Uh, so we made it as, as homey as we can with the idea that we know when these guys come back from their mission, they're going to be stressful. But if you get a Coke and popcorn, Okay, it's hard to be stressed for long, and the guys, the officers really appreciate it. So in their VA-85, which was an ASEC-6 squadron, okay, a VA-82, which was a A-7A squadron, VA-86, which was uh, another A-7 squadron, okay, and this is where the bulk of, of the, the things that, that uh, CTF-77 was interested in because this is where the bombing was actually taking place. Uh, I did the ready rooms of VA, uh, VF-102 and 33, uh, but they were primarily doing what we call bar cap, which was the bar, the bear cap, uh, which were the, the Russians were involved and they would come down and, and so on and we had to fly against them, and, and also uh, the fighter cover for the attack aircraft. But uh, until maybe mid-cruise, uh, we didn't have much uh, activity. I think that the, uh, the, the, the Air Force, the North Vietnamese Air Force was pretty suppressed during that gap. So there we'd be, and, and my job was to uh, to get quotes, to talk about bomb damage assessment. And the force that I worked against was quite simply, um, a lot of pilots didn't want to give us quotes because if 
um, a North Vietnamese prison guard could associate the loss of people in his hometown with that pilot, life would become very, very miserable for him in captivity. And then the flip side was those, those officers that were interested in developing a reputation for themselves, okay, and to help to have a dossier for, for promotion in the Navy, they would give me good BDA, good quotes, stuff like that. And then at the end of the, the, end of the day, okay, afternoon, I'd spend the time writing my story, and you had to work, wait, you couldn't do it in advance because you never knew what your lead was going to be because you're still fighting the same rules of journalism. So then you'd make a decision what your lead's going to be, write your story, uh, best, best to worst, okay, and go from, and go from there. Uh, and then uh, develop a, a, a confidential message with a big C on it. Okay, and uh, the uh, uh, Lieutenant Gray, Gray would review it, okay, make any changes that uh, were felt to enhance naval aviation more than, from an adjective standpoint, more than I would uh, have uh, would used already. And, uh, and he took it to the captain, captain approved it. It got sent over to a group called Detachment Charlie in um, Saigon and was released at, I believe it's the 5 o'clock Follies it was called, uh, where all the military information that came through would be available to the international press. They would then put their spin on it and go from there. A couple of interesting things that, that happened um, when we uh, got uh, Big shoot down, uh, Lieutenant Cash of, of uh, 33, I knocked down a MIG, was I wrote a story about him and what happened and all this other stuff. And then I read it again at Stars and Tripe over the byline, word for word, of an Army Spec 4. And that was really painful because uh, it was a good story and it was mine. And if I ever find that guy, you know, we got word, we'll have words. The next thing was, um, other things that would happen would be, um, we'd send a bunch of, let's say, four planes against 30, uh, they, were, they were metric ton bladders that were used to hold fuel, okay? So when the North Vietnamese trucks would come down, they'd have to refuel, and that's what they would do. Well, we, we sent a group of four planes. We only got two of the four, so I wrote them. I wrote it up that way, and um, I mentioned Lieutenant Gray's audit. Well, by the end of the day, we had all four. Uh, so those were the types of things. And then we started to lose people. 